Thank you so much for joining the online experience today. Be sure to like, comment, and share this experience with everyone you know. Let's dive in. So I want you to take your Bibles, if you would. We're going to be in the Old Testament today. We're going to be in the book of Exodus chapter 4 as we continue our series called Stories. Each week, we're unpacking a great Bible story as well as some of your stories. So we've been watching some of your stories every week. We have one more for you to see today. Turn your attention to our screen. Hi, my name is Dalian Lim. Uh, I've been going to Northwest Church for a little over a year with my daughter. Um, I had the opportunity to actually go on the missions trip uh, this past week uh, to Treasure Key, Bahamas. Just the way that we all came together as a team, not knowing who each other were, um, we were able to actually just um, get things accomplished. But it, the highlight was really just getting to know the people there and how grateful they are uh, for the help that we have provided them um, in trying to rebuild their church. God, God knows exactly what we need. He knows exactly what we need. And then you look around and see what you guys are, are doing now and what you're accomplishing. Um, it's just amazing. It hopefully it um, propels us to continue to keep moving forward, continue progressing, continue doing until we see the completion of it. Isn't it great? Missions, it's not just something we do, but it's who we are at Northwest Church. And I'm so proud of Preston and Lisa for leading our team and, and, and worked on the church there. And even as I speak this morning, we had Eric and Angie Sonova. They left right after the 830 experience, taking 25 people from here and going to Royal Family uh, Camp to serve uh, this coming week. So will you just put your hands together for everybody to participate in our missions here. If you've never been on a missions trip, let me encourage you to carve out a week in your schedule and your budget and put that down and be a part of a missions week here at Northwest Church. Well, here's what we know. Everyone has a story, and today we're going to be looking at the story of Moses. Now, I didn't have enough confidence in you guys that if I unpack the entire story that you would stay with me the entire day. So I'm only going to be sharing a story within the story. So it's kind of like last week we talked about David, but there's no way we can unpack all of David's life in one setting. setting. So today we're going to be looking at a story within the story. So let's talk about Moses just for a little bit. Let me give you a little backdrop. He was born as an Israelite but raised as an Egyptian in the palace with Pharaoh. So he was accustomed to luxury, education, and obviously being raised in the Egyptian culture. And one day he saw a fellow Israelite being beaten by an Egyptian slave driver, and he retaliated by killing the Egyptian. People soon found out, so Moses fled Egypt to live in the desert. Now I want you to note the transition. This is a major intersection in transition in his life, He's been raised in the palace. He's accustomed to everything being catered and given to him. And seemingly overnight, he leaves the palace. He moves to the backside of the desert where he meets a woman and he gets married and goes to work with his father-in-law. Now let that sink in for a moment. He leaves the palace, goes to the backside of the desert, to gets married, goes to work with his father-in-law, and above all that, he's tending sheep. And one day, when he's on the backside of the desert, he's tending the sheep, all of a sudden, he notices that a bush catches on fire. Now, first of all, the burning bush in this particular desert, this particular bush, it was not uncommon for, that, for those bushes to catch on fire. They would catch on fire because of the intense heat, and immediately, they would burn up. But this one caught his attention because this bush caught on fire and did not burn out. So Moses inquired, he went over there, inquisitive, he goes over there, and out of the burning bush, God, the creator, speaks to him and says, Moses, I've got a mission for you to do. I want you to go back to Egypt, and I want you to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Now, the children of Israel had been living in slavery for 430 years. 430 years, God heard the cries of his people 
430 years later, he answers their prayer. So the next time you get discouraged because God doesn't answer your prayer right away, think about the children of Israel. So again, he has this responsibility. Now, Pharaoh at this particular time was the most powerful, the most influential man probably on the entire earth. And Moses has this mandate, this, this plan this, that God had given to him to go back and tell him, you got to let God's people go. So it was a great plan, but there was only one problem. And let's do some reading. Are you guys ready for this? So this is Exodus chapter 4, verse 10. So God spoke to Moses and said, Moses, I want you to go back to Egypt. I want you to tell Pharaoh to let my people go. Here's what Moses said to the Lord. He said, oh, Lord, I'm not very good with words. By the way, most Bible scholars believe that he had a stuttering problem. He had a speech impediment. He says, I have never been, I am not now, even though you have spoken to me, I get tongue-tied and my words get tangled. If you go back and look in the original language, he's literally referring to himself as a dumb person when he's talking to God. Lord, I cannot speak well enough. Now, you think about this. Pharaoh's the most powerful man on the face of the earth. So the presentation that Moses has to give him is a very important presentation. And you think if you're going to get up in front of Pharaoh and all of his officials that you would at least should have the ability to speak well. That's what Moses is saying. God, this is Mo. Don't you know I cannot speak well? This is me. This is your buddy Moses down here, and I'm dumb. I cannot do this. Verse 11 says, then the Lord asked Moses, who makes a person's mouth? Who decides whether people speak or do not speak, hear or do not hear, see or do not see? Is it not I, the Lord? Look at verse 12. He says, now go, I will be with you. I want you to underline with you, circle that, highlight it. I'm going to come back and talk about that in a moment. He says, now go, I will be with you as you speak, and I will instruct you on what to say. Now, Moses understood the mission, but most likely, according to his response, he felt very inadequate and very insecure to go and talk to Pharaoh about letting God's people go, again, because of his inability to speak well. And and on top of all of that, the last time he was there, he killed an Egyptian, So you can only imagine how inadequate, unqualified, insecure that he was about going back and telling Pharaoh that God said, let my people go. Now, you look at all of that, you think, Moses had to think as a leader, who's going to follow me? I cannot speak very well. I killed an Egyptian the last time I was there. Who's going to follow me? Well, like many of us, Moses probably felt like He had to be perfect. And that's really when I read this, this is what I get out of this, that Moses, with all the excuses that he was given to God on why he was unqualified and all the reasons why he could not go back or should not go back and do what God called him to do, it was this this mindset that I have to be perfect in order to go back. Now, this is not a trick question, but how many of you who are in this room this morning would raise your hand and say that sometimes you feel the pressure of perfection, that you feel like that you just have to be perfect, perfect at getting married, perfect at marriage, perfect at relationships, perfect with your health. And and we just, it's really, it's, it's part of our culture today. And a lot of that is, it's social media. Social media creates this unrealistic expectations. I mean, many of our students today feel the pressure of perfection, of not measuring up, meaning I'm not good enough. I'm never going to be good enough. There's this pressure of perfection. Like, we want to be perfect in what we look like. We want to be perfect in our health. We want to be perfect in our relationship with Jesus Christ. And it's just this pressure, and it mounts. And as this pressure mounts, it creates this, well, I got to do better and I got to do more because why? I don't measure up and I'm not good enough. So there's this ongoing pressure to perform, to meet the standards, to get the grades, to get the scholarship, to get the perfect boyfriend or girlfriend or have the perfect marriage or to have the, or the best promotion at work. 
It's like this drive that's inside of us, and we are literally killing ourselves because we want the perfect marriage, the perfect house, the perfect vacation, the perfect mom, the perfect kids. Let me help you. There are no perfect people in this world. Northwest Church is not a perfect church. If you leave here, okay, you'll go to another one. It's not perfect either. If you're in search of a perfect pastor, it's not me. If you leave me, go somewhere else. The next guy's not going to be perfect either. If you're looking for the perfect spouse, okay, leave today, get a divorce, go marry somebody else. Guess what? They are not going to be perfect either. And moms and dads, I hate to disappoint you, but your kids are not perfect either. Oh, I, I hit a little nerve there, didn't we're, My point is, we're not perfect. But here's where we are. Anything short of perfection, it causes this fear, this anxiety, this drive, this depression. And it literally overwhelms us. It overtakes us and it overwhelms us because we're like, well, I want to be more like, well, I saw where they went on vacation, so I want to go there. And, and I saw where they were building a house, so I want to build that. Well, I saw what he was wearing, so I want to wear that. And it's just, it's created this drive within us that we feel like that we have to be perfect. And if we're not, then we're disappointed. We're like, I just don't measure up. And then it's like, And the more we desire to be perfect, the more we try, I got to do more, I got to do better. And the more we do and the better we do, guess what? We face this reality that none of us are perfect. Well, I want you to know the pressure for perfection is real. Moses had to feel this pressure. He's going before the most important, the most powerful man on the face of the earth, And he has to go before him. By the way, the last time he was there, he killed a guy. And he's got to go stand before him and said, God said, let my people go. Well, what if it didn't work? What if he went to Pharaoh and he he got tongue-tied? He began to stutter and he, he didn't get it out well. What if he said the wrong thing? What if Pharaoh would have had him killed? When we, like Moses, face the pressure of perfection, I want you to put this in your lunchbox today. And when you take it home with you, I want you to I want you to remember three things. The next time you think or you feel, I've got to be perfect. Are y'all ready for this? Is this helping anybody? Okay. Number one, I want you to remember the next time that you feel this urge or this desire that I have to be perfect, I want you to remember that God chose you. That God chose you. So going back, chapter earlier, chapter 3, verse 10, here's what God says. Now go. He's talking to Moses. He said, I'm sending you to Pharaoh. You must lead my people, Israel, out of Egypt. You, you must go. Now, Moses was God's choice for the mission. Now, if it would have been left up to Moses, Moses most likely would have never left the desert. He would have never gone back to Egypt. In reality, Moses probably was the most qualified person for this position. He was raised in Egypt as an Israelite. He knew the culture, but he also knew what the Jewish people were feeling as slaves. He was the right person for the job. Sure, he had done the wrong thing by murdering the slave driver. And many of the Israelites, by the way, had already rejected him. So on one hand, you look at this and say, well, Moses is the right guy for the job. And on the other hand, you say, no, we're going to throw his resume away or at least put it at the bottom of the pile because he's the least qualified guy to go there. Because if he's going to lead the people of Israel, and I want you to watch how they felt about him. Moses chapter 2, verse 13 and 14. So Moses one day goes out and visits the people. He saw two Hebrew men fighting. He says, why are you beating up your friend? Moses said to the one who started the fight, the man replied, who appointed you to be our prince and judge? Are you going to kill me as you killed the Egyptian yesterday? Now watch this. Then Moses was afraid thinking, everyone knows what I did. Now let that sink in. How is that feeling? When you feel like everyone knows what I did. Maybe you feel like Moses. Why would God choose me when everyone knows what I have done? Why would God choose me when I can't do, come on, what he's calling me to do? Well, I want you to know that, yes, God chooses you based on talent, based on your qualifications, but that's not the only thing. Because if God only chose us because of our qualifications, how many of you know we would always fall short? 
Because it doesn't matter how smart you are, how much money you have, how much knowledge you have. It doesn't matter how high your capacity is. All of us are going to reach our lid one of these days where we're not enough. Well, I want you to know God doesn't just call you based on who you are, but he calls you based on who he is. God doesn't choose you just because of your qualifications, but maybe it's a willingness to obey. Jeremiah chapter 1 and verse 5 says that I knew you, God is speaking, before I formed you in your mother's womb. By the way, that word knew is an intimate word many times in the Old Testament. But the word knew here, what it means, if you go back and look in the original language, it means I knitted you. Now, I want you to imagine that. God, the creator, who spoke everything that we see into existence. And he said, before you were in your mother's womb, I was already busy with my own hands and I was knitting you together. I was taking this part of your personality and this part of your personality and this, and I was knitting all of that together. Now, I'm a visual person and when I think about the, how could God call me, how could God ask me to do what I'm, I'm not qualified to do this, I'm not smart enough. There's other people that can speak better. There's other smarter people, better strat and, and all. But yet, I go back to what he said to Jeremiah. Before you were in your mother's womb, I was knitting you together. So all the flaws that you're talking about and all the excuses that you have, I already knew about those excuses. I already knew about your shortfalls. And I knew about all of those things that enter your life and all the reasons why you're telling me that you can't do what I've called you to do. I knew about those things. I made them part of who you are today and even though I knew those I still called you and I still have a mission for you to do so I want you to know that God still has a plan for you today and even before you were in your mother's womb he was busy knitting you together and all of those inadequacies and all of those insecurities he knew about them ahead of time and he still chose you that's powerful that he knew that we would make mistakes, that he knew that we would have a shortfall, that he, would kn he knew ahead of time that we would never measure up, and yet he still chose us. I want you to write this, I want you to write this down today. Please. God doesn't make mistakes with his choices. God doesn't make mistakes with his choices. And I don't understand it. It's perplexing to me. But God in his sovereignty, he chooses for whatever the reason to place his hand on people and say, I'm going to put my hand on you. I'm going to bless you. I'm going to anoint you. I'm going to call you. And I'm going to ask you to do great things for me. I can't explain that. And I don't have to explain it. I don't understand it. And we don't have to understand it. Okay? The point is God chose you. And that's the end of the conversation. God chose Moses. You, don't, you think God knew about his starting problem? Do you think he already knew he was dumb? You think that? Oh, it's like God said, oh, yeah, I forgot you stutter, so we got to go get somebody else that can speak better. No, God already knew that ahead of time, and he still chose Moses. Number two, when you feel the pressure to feel perfect or to be perfect, leave the results to God. Look at Exodus chapter 4, verse 12. This is powerful. Y'all ready? Come on, guys. Are y'all getting anything out of this? It's good. Look at verse 12. He says, now go. I will, what? Be with you. You underline that. You circled that earlier. Here's what that means. That literally means to walk along beside. In the original language, that's translated as to walk along beside. So Moses, you think about this. He's on this journey. He's leaving Egypt. I mean, he's, he's leaving the desert. He's on his way back to Egypt. And I'm sure he's thinking, well, I got this starting problem. So he's practicing his speech. He's going over his mind. Well, here's what I'm going to say. Here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to wear it. No, I don't need to wear that. I'm going to do No, I don't need to do that. And he's just going. And that whole time, he's processing what he's going to say, what he's going to do when he's get there. Guess what? God the Father is walking along right beside of him. Well, guess what happens? Listen, this is important. God is walking along beside of us. Some of the pressure we are experiencing, we put on ourselves. Often our anxiety comes from trusting in ourselves too much. Like it all hinges or it all depends on us. 
Moses didn't want to go. Matter of fact, he threw the book of excuses at God. He couldn't do it on his own. That's what he was trying to say is, God, I'm not qualified to do this. And God's like, I know. That's the whole point. I just needed you to know that this is not left up to you, that this mission does not hinge on you, but it hinges on me. When we are not enough, God is. When we're not enough, God is. We could take a lot of pressure off of ourselves by simply obeying God and trusting that he is going to work things out. But what happens is we have this stress and all of this pressure, sleepless nights, because we think the results are left up to us. And when we can't see the end game, when we can't see where this problem is going or this relationship is going or where the economy is going, if you're in business or whatever it may be, when we can't see the end or maybe we're doing things and we're strategizing and we're planning, but yet we don't see any results, we get all stressed out. Again, it's that problem pressure to perform. It's that pressure that everything has to be perfect. I want you to know it's our responsibility to be faithful, but leave the results up to God because we are not responsible for the results. So when you feel the pressure as a parent to raise your children in this crazy off the rails world that we are living in, you do your best, but you leave it to God. You pray over your children. You teach your children right from wrong. And when they leave that home and leave your side, you say, God, they're in your protection. They're under your protection. They belong to you, Lord. And I'm going to leave the results of their life up to you. And students, when you feel the pressure of fitting in, you know how kids just, I got to fit in. I got I to gotta do this. Listen, you do your best. Leave the results to God. Mom, when you, when you experience the pressure to be the perfect mom this summer, just do your best and leave the results up to God. There's no perfect mom, and you're not responsible for the results because I'm here to tell you, moms, you can do all the right things, and you can plan all the right things, and it's never going to work out the way that you hope that it would work out. <laughs> My mom used to say, can we just, just can everybody can stop fighting. Can we just have Thanksgiving without anybody getting in a fight? My whole point is, do your best, leave the results up to God. Now watch this, because when our trust is in God and not in ourselves, it takes all of the pressure and the stress and anxiety off from us. That's why he says to cast all of your cares one translation says, cast all of your anxiety on him. Why? Because he cares about you. He don't want you worried about this. He doesn't want you stressed out about this. He don't want you dealing with anxiety about this. Why? Because it's not left up to you. Come on, guys. We cast it to him. We give it to him. We throw it up on him and say, God, I've done my best, and I'm going to leave the results to you. I'm going to trust that you know what you're doing here because I don't i got to finish this. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 27 says, It was by faith that Moses left the land of Egypt, not fearing the king's anger. Now watch this. That word faith is translated as a trust or confidence in God. Now you got to get this. Because Moses, it didn't say that he left to go do what God called him to do because of faith that he had in himself. Well, let me tell you this. One of the reasons and one of the ways that you know that it's God asking you to do something is when it's bigger and beyond you, meaning that you cannot do it on your own, meaning if God doesn't intervene, if God doesn't help you, you are going to be a miserable failure. That's one of the ways that you know. Moses could not have done this without the instruction of God, without God walking alongside of him. But it was faith. It was a trust and a confidence, not in himself, not in his ability or his inability, but it was in God. His faith was greater. His faith in God was greater than his fear in himself. That's important. Number three. Moses made a decision, number three. He refused to quit. I want you to write this down because I'm going to talk to you for a moment. I want to be pastor just for a moment. And I want everybody to look at me. Everyone in the room, everyone watching online, I want you to hear my heart. 
Don't send me an email because it's not about politics. This crazy world that we live in today, it's like everybody wants to quit. There, there's a quitting spirit in this world today. People don't like their job, they quit. If you expect them to show up, do their job with a good attitude, they just quit and go somewhere else. They don't like their spouse, they just quit. They just, that's what we do, quit. Don't like that diet, we're going to quit. Don't like going to the gym, quit. Don't like that church, I'm quitting. Don't like that pastor, I'm just going to quit. Let me tell you something. I've made up my mind, and I've made this statement multiple times in the last few years of my life. Everyone can quit but me. I want you to let that get in your spirit today. Everyone has the right to quit but you. Everyone can walk away but you can't. I'm going to talk more about this in a moment. But I want you to quit using that as an excuse to not do what God's called you to do. We can't quit. Everybody else is quitting. That's okay. Let them quit. My dad used to have this saying, I'd say, I'd try this thing like, Dad, I, I need to go there. Why do you need to go? Well, Dad, everybody's going there. He'd say, well, no, Joe, everybody's not going there. I'm not going there. Your mama's not going there. And your other seven brothers and sisters are not going there. And guess what? You're not going there. So everybody's not going there, Joe. So everybody can quit, but you're not quitting. Come on, guys. Are y'all with me? I'm going to talk about this. The continuation of verse 27 says, Moses, he says, he kept right on going. Right on going means he endured. We, we need some people that will endure today. We need some people who's going to keep on going today. Because, watch this, Scripture says, he kept on going. Why? Was it his drive? Was it, was it his ability to keep grinding it out? Was it, was it his? No, no. Because he kept his eyes on the one who is invisible. So if Moses would have taken his eyes and attention off of God and put it on the people that he was leading, let me tell you what he would have done. He would have quit. If he would have taken his eyes off of God and put on the people on the mission that God had asked him to do, he would have quit. That's the reason a lot of people quit today is because they're not looking at God they're looking at their situation. They're looking at their relationship. They're looking at their circumstance. And they're like, I'm done with this. If Moses had known the obstacles that he would face after God spoke to him on that day in the back of the desert at a burning bush, if because think about this. How many of you ever want to know all of it from God A to Z at one time? Don't you just want to know all of it? Like, God, give me all of the pieces. To... Well, one of the reasons he doesn't do that, because you would freak out. And you would not ever leave if you knew what was waiting for you and what was ahead of you. If he had knew what he was going back to, if he knew that Pharaoh was going to say yes, and then no, and then yes, and then no, yes, then no, and all, all that, he would have never done that. If he would have known that these 2.5 million people, instead of being happy and filled with joy, that they're no longer slaves, and they're happy that Pastor Moses showed up to lead them out of Egypt, if he knew they were going to be complaining the entire way, don't you think he would have left them in Egypt? <laughs> That's exactly right. I mean, Moses gets out there. The people start complaining, and they're probably having a business meeting one day, and somebody brings up the idea, let's kill Moses. <laughs> and if I'm Moses, I'm like, that did it. I'm loading every one of you people back up. Y'all want to go back to Egypt? You think it was better back there? You pack your bags. We're leaving the hotel today, and we're going back there. I mean, I want you to think about this. Can you imagine how tired and frustrated and exhausted you get when you get ready to go on a trip? And I want you to just visualize some of your moments. I'll give you time to repent here in a minute. <laughs> so in these moments, you're getting ready to go on the trip. Maybe it's a vacation. You've been looking forward to it. You've planned. you told everybody in the house, we're leaving today at 1 o'clock. 1255, you can't find, where, well, he's over playing with a friend. Well, I thought we were leaving at one. I mean, you get, by the time you get everybody in the car, everybody's so mad. <laughs> Come on, you spend the first three hours and nobody's saying a word, nobody's talking, because you're just trying to get your three or four people together. Well, can you imagine Moses with 2.5 million church people? <laughs> 
Let me tell you, if I had that, I wouldn't even come back next week. <laughs> you know what? Somebody would get up, Jay would get up and say, he gone. <laughs> he gone. Nobody knows where he gone to. He's just gone. <laughs> I wouldn't tell anybody. But, only, but think about it. If he would have known about the Red Sea, if he would have known about the lack of food, the ungrateful people, the betrayal, and the feelings of isolation, but instead he didn't quit. Why? Because his eyes was not on the Red Sea. It was not on the ungrateful people. He kept going because his eye was on the invisible one. It was on God. If you're going to keep going, if you're going to have the mindset that you're not going to quit and walk away, you got to get your mind on God and you got to stay focused on God. God, because he's the only perfect one. Everybody else is going to let you down, <laughs> and everybody else is going to disappoint you, including Pastor Joe. <laughs> Somebody one time said, everything you want in life is right on the other side of not giving up. That is so true. Everybody's giving up and walking away. Can't do that. When you feel the pressure for perfection, it would be so much easier to quit. It's always easy to quit. It's always the easiest thing to do is quit and to settle for less. But instead, you got to keep going. I'm close. I'm done. I'm getting close. Galatians chapter 6 verse 9 says, but here's what Paul says. He said, let's not get tired. That word tired, by the way, here's how it's translated. It's not just like, like you're tired and you need to like, sit down and rest for a minute. To be utterly spiritless. I Meaning you've lost your spirit, your drive to continue, your desire to keep moving. It's gone. You're exhausted. You're, you're at the dead end and you're like, I can't do this anymore. And you're not, not only I can't do it, I don't want to do it anymore. Let me tell you, that's where a lot of people are today. They don't want to do life anymore. They're, they're done with this. But Paul says, don't get tired of doing what is good. Why? Because just at the right time, that right time is God's time. <laughs> His time is never my time. He, just, we, he don't work with me on that stuff. But just at the right time, we will reap a harvest if. That word if makes it contingent. If what? If we don't give up. Now, here's what I know. You can't choose what talent you have or don't have. You can't choose what you look like. Wouldn't that be great? We can't choose what we look like. We, we, we can't choose... Our, our health to some degree. We can't choose a lot of things. We can't choose what God's calling us to do, but we can choose to not quit. Moses could not quit. Why? Because there was too much at stake. If Moses would have quit, it would have affected 2.5 million plus people. The stakes are too high for you to quit now and to walk away from God. Anyone who's ever tried to do something significant for God, believe me, have had thoughts of quitting. Now, I'm going to give you something that's going to help you here in a moment. It's okay to think about quitting as long as you don't. Because I was raised for it. Man, you can't even think about it. Like, like you start thinking about it, and you just want to hit yourself or slap yourself. Self, you can't do that because you're a failure if you think about quitting. No, you're not a failure if you think about quitting. If you do anything significant in life, you're going to think about quitting. If y'all knew how many times I thought about quitting, <laughs> all y'all would quit today. <laughs> it's, it's, it's human nature. It's innate in us to want to quit and want to walk away and want to give up. It's okay. Pastor Tommy Barnett said, the more you have to quit, the more you want to quit. You can enjoy the luxury of wanting to quit if you know you're not going to quit. So I already know, I may talk about it, I may think about it, but I already know before I get to that point that there's no way I'm quitting and there's no way I'm walking away from God. There's no way I'm walking away from what God's calling me to do. Quitting is a choice, but so is not quitting. Let everybody else quit, but be like Moses. Let it be said when it's written about you that he kept right on going, that she kept right on going. 
People are walking away from their faith, their job, their church, their family. And I'm here to say today, you stay faithful and you say, I am not going to quit. I'm not going to give up. God's got too much invested in me. I have come too far and I've done too much. And devil, I want you to know, I may want to quit. It's hard. I want to quit, but I'm not going to. Come on. We got to get this mindset that we got to keep on going. Acts 20, and I say, I'm closing, this is it. Jerry, wheels are coming down right here, my friend. He's a pilot. Jesus. Paul said in Acts chapter 20, verse 24, he says, I do know that it won't be a picnic. How many know life is not a picnic? How many of you know being married is not a picnic? Unless you're Christy, it is not a picnic, Okay. <laughs> Raising kids is not a picnic. Serving Christ is not a picnic. Paul says, I do know that it won't be a picnic. For the Holy Spirit is letting me know repeatedly and clearly there's going to be some t hard times ahead of me. I'm going to be beaten. I'm going to be imprisoned. I'm going to be isolated. People are going to falsely accuse me. There are going to be some people that's even going to doubt that God's got his call on my life. But watch this. He says, but that matters little. He finishes with what matters most to me is to finish what God started. Now look at me for a moment. If it feels in your life that the gates of hell have swung wide open and every demonic spirit in that hell has been unleashed in this world, it has. The Bible is very clear about what it's going to be like as we get closer to the return of Christ. There's a spirit of oppression in this world like I've never seen in my lifetime. Does it feel like you're worn out all the time? Does it feel like you're running in quicksand? Does it feel like the more you try, the harder it gets? Does it feel that way? Let me tell you something. Now don't, 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 don't overcook this, okay? But this is important. It's spiritual warfare. The Bible is very clear. As we get closer to the end of time, watch this. There's going to be a great falling away from the faith. You know why? Because of the pressure that the enemy is putting on us. The pressure that he's putting on our health. The, the pressure that he puts on our choices. The pressure of trying to be perfect. It's that pressure. He keeps applying that pressure. And the persecution that you're seeing around our world and starting to come to America today. I've preached about this for you. It's happening. That's only going to get more severe as we get closer to the return of of Christ. Now, why is that? Why does the devil want to put all of that oppression, all of the, why is he just trying to push and pull and just, why, why? Because he wants you to fall away from the faith. He wants you to quit serving Christ. He wants you to give up on the church. He wants, to, he wants you to give up on each other and he wants you to walk away and he wants you to quit. But we can't. Amen. Because at the right time, we are going to reap a reward if we don't quit and if we don't give up. Listen to me. We're too close. We're literally on the front porch of eternity. We're too close to give up and to forfeit our reward today. So everybody else can quit but us. And we got to keep going. And I want to close with this because I wrote this in my notes <clears throat> late in this sermon. This whole perfection thing is real. Because of social media, because of our entertainment, we have this, we, we, I, 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 I got to be perfect because they're perfect. No, they're not. Well, we think they, but we, that's, I want to give you something to think about. This is what I wrote down. I would rather be real than perfect. Because perfect is not real or realistic. I would rather be real than perfect because perfect does not exist. Now, there was only one perfect person in this world, and they put him on the cross. So if you want to rush to that, go right ahead. Okay? It's not perfect. It's not real, nor is it realistic. So I want you to look at me for a moment. It's okay to be real. Let me tell you what real looks like. Real is not always real good. 
No, I'm, I'm talking about my side of the fence. Being real is not always real good. Being real is just being real. That's not an excuse to sin. I'm not saying that. We, we got to quit this. I, I'm trying to be perfect and I want everybody to think I'm perfect. No, let's be real. And you'll stand out in this world because this world is fake. And all these people who claim and look like they're perfect, it's fake. So quit buying into that. Learn to be real because God, when you were in your mother's womb, was knitting the real you together. All of your insecurities, inadequacies, all of your flaws. He took all of that in consideration and said, I choose you. Leave the results up to me. All you got to do is keep going. I'll take care of the rest of it. Will you bow your head with me this morning, please? What an incredible experience. Today, if you made the decision to follow Christ, we'd love to hear about it. Head over to northwestchurch.tv and let us know today.